Okay. So I should say that uh, this talk is uh, joint work with uh, Doug Miller, a colleague of mine at University of California, Davis, and earlier uh, another co-author was uh, Jonah Gelbach. And we're, it's based on a paper that is coming out in uh, Journal of Human Resources. So Journal of Human Resources is having uh, a, a special, well, symposium with several papers on interest, uh, on uh, matters of interest to uh, empirical microeconomists. Uh, there's one on waiting, you know, when, whether it should be wait or not. Uh, I just can't remember because I just saw it recently, but Hido Imbens has a, a, a paper that will be in that as well. And the current version of the paper is available at my website. So rather, you know, if you're interested in this, uh, just Google me, go to papers, and there'll be a version of this paper there. Eventually, we say we'll put up a website that has some sample code and examples uh, for clustering. Okay, let me... Okay, so this is a little bit of a dry uh, talk. Uh, so what I'm going to, do, and fairly specialised in places, so hopefully the first half of it pretty much everyone can follow and I'll try and give a lot of fairly uh, simple introduction to it, uh, but then maybe towards the end of the talk it's of interest to fewer people, but those people actually will be uh, quite interested. Very simple problem, it's just straight ordinary least squares, okay? The methods generalized to other models, you know, nonlinear models, logit, you name it, but we're just thinking about straight, ordinary least squares. Furthermore, our estimator is consistent, right? So it's a well-specified model. Right? All we're concerned about is how precise have we estimated beta, right? As simple as that. And uh, if you, you know, I'm going to talk mainly about stata because that's what the majority of people, or not most people use, that are, are uh, analyzing uh, microeconomic data. Uh, but also, particularly for clustering, Stata offers more than um, other, most other statistical packages. Okay, But in Stata and in other packages, what you do is you go, say, regress yx, and that gives you some output. Uh, then there are these options, right? So the, the default would be the we assume the errors are independent, identically distributed. Uh, but then you say, well, actually, I think the error variance differs across individuals. Okay, so then there's a uh, heteroscedastic robust option. Right, so you go regress y x comma v c robust. Okay, if you have time series, right, the errors could be serially correlated. There, if we're concerned that they're serially correlated. Uh, well, ideally, you'd go regress yx, comma, vc, hack. Actually, in Stata, you have to give the new e command, a new e yx, and that'll give you uh, heteroscedastic and autocorrelation consistent uh, standard errors. Okay. What this talk about is about is going uh, regress yx, comma, vc, cluster. And the idea is that uh, we have individuals, say, in villages. Within one village, we think there's error correlation. So if we, say, overestimate for one individual in the village, we're likely to overestimate for other individuals in the village. But across villages, there's independence. Okay. And we're going to, or at least the theory will assume, that we have lots of villages. Right. So the asymptotic theory is the number of villages is going to infinity. Okay. And... Uh, that's the easy bit, right? The harder bit is issues like, well, do I have to cluster or not? What if I have a couple of reasons to cluster? What should I do? Uh, what if the number of clusters is not infinite, but I've only got eight villages, right? Uh, in that case, our usual asymptotic theory doesn't work so well. What should I do? Okay, so, but to begin with, I'll talk about just the simple problem. Okay, so why is this important? Okay. If you have heteroscedastic robust standard errors, my experience is usually they're sometimes 20% larger, sometimes 20% smaller. Okay. With uh, 
hack standard errors, it can make a bigger difference. But in the clustering setting, in some applications, and I'll give examples, you can be way, way out if you don't appropriately adjust for clustered errors. Right? And the intuition is that if all these individuals are, you know, the errors are correlated, the information that's coming out from adding an additional person is not all that great because there were lots of correlated individuals beforehand. And we can be out by a factor of, say, three or four on the standard errors, right? So we have a T of six or eight. But if, if we use default or heteroscedastic robust standard errors, if we cluster robust, that T could be two or even less, okay? So uh, it's important. For, fortunately, it's not always that way, but it can be. Okay, so, um, and the other thing about this is that this setting does arise a lot in practice, right? So it's not just, you know, this happens in a few studies. This is actually present uh, in a lot of common uh, applications, problems that we're really interested in uh, as economists. Okay, and then, you know, I just said a little bit about the subtleties to begin with. Right? You know, basically, there's enough there that it warrants a paper. It's not... So here's an example. We're interested in does our theory of compensating wage differentials actually work when we confront it with data, right? So according to that theory, when we control for everything we can think to control for, uh, as a job gets riskier, the uh, wage should go up in the job to compensate for that risk, okay? Controlling for age of the individual worker, education, occupation, and so on. So what we'd like to do is run a regression of wage on the usual controls and uh, the risk of injury in the individual's job. We don't have that data. We have more aggregated data. We know what the job injury risk is in the industry that they work in or in the occupation that they work in. So this model here, it's individual, it's cross-section data, individual I, and then G is for group, right? Group or cluster G. Uh, and then this is education, age, gender, etc. Then this is the job injury risk rate, and I, the grouping here is on occupation. Okay. So this regressor is not varying across uh, individuals. Okay. And the need to or you know to get cluster robust standard errors is when we both have a regressor of interest that's highly that's correlated within the grouping and in this case it's perfectly correlated this is an extreme example uh, and this error is correlated within the group right so here the thought is there could be a risk that if we over predict the wage, say, for one person in the industry, we're likely to overpredict for others uh, in the same industry. Okay. And uh, it's a combination of the two. And if we have a lot of individuals in the cluster, if this is, well, basically, if combined, even if these two are fairly small, if we have lots of individual, the correlation is fairly small, if we have lots of individuals, uh, we can still. Uh, really need to uh, get cluster robust standard errors. Okay, so that's what I've said here, right? There's two, right? If this wasn't correlated or if this wasn't correlated, no need to cluster robust, right? But if both are correlated, then we need to cluster robust. And as that correlation goes up and we have more individuals in each grouping, uh, there's more and more need to do the cluster robust. Okay, so I have a data example. This is a stripped down uh, version of uh, this data set, which originally was in an, uh, a 1998 uh, American Economic Review article by Joni Hirsch. Okay, so we've got our dependent variable is log wage. We have 1498 individuals. Uh, this, this is years of potential experience, uh, experience squared, years of education, union member or not, non-white or not, and three region dummies with a, an omitted region being the south. Okay. And then this is the uh, 
injury rate in the occupation. So it's on average three injuries per, I don't know actually, it's either going to be 1,000 jobs or you know 10,000 jobs. Okay. And uh, what I chose were the nine occupations that had the most uh, individuals. Okay, so we only have nine clusters, so one problem is going to be that our asymptotic theory is not going to work so well. Okay, so we run the regression, and these are four different ways of getting standard errors. So regress, Y on our variable of interest, the injury rate in the occupation, and then these are the co covariates, the regresses. Default, heteroscedastic robust, cluster robust, clustering on occupation, and then in Stata, there are several different ways to do cluster robust. So this is just a regular regression and then cluster robust. Alternatively, we can use the panel commands. Even though this is not panel data here, the panel commands also work for any sort of grouping. Right? Some of the panel commands additionally require that, you know, that grouping within the group, there's a time series dimension. Some do not. Right, but here I'm just going XT set on the grouping. I don't have a, a time variable here as well. Okay. So what we would do in Stata then is set, so this is saying the grouping is occupation, and then XT reg, okay, PA is population averaged. Correlation independent says we are assuming that the errors are independent. So this bit here gives us ordinary least squares estimates once again. Then the VCE robust, okay? In the most recent versions of Stata, if it's a panel command, Stata realizes robust means grouping robust, panel robust, okay? In earlier versions, it would just go with heteroscedastic robust, but now it realizes this is grouping, right? So we would think that this would give exactly, these two would give exactly the same thing, okay? So let's look at the results. Uh, this is the first five regresses, the, there's another, slide coming up with the rest. So you'll see throughout uh, minus, it's the same coefficient, 0 0.0448, 0 0.0448, 0 0.0448, 0 0.0448. Surprisingly, the uh, coefficient is negative, so say as injury rate goes up, controlling for thing, other, everything else, the uh, wage actually falls. Right, and that was the point of the Hirsch paper that this is from, is to, to explain that surprising result. Uh, I'm just using the data here. And then the next line are the standard errors. Okay, so in the, for this regressor, uh, the default was the same as heteroscedastic robust. For other regressors, 39, 37, uh, 362, 336, so that difference is about 10%. Heteroscedastic robust, not all that different from the default. That particularly makes sense here because when a log wage, uh, taking the log, the error is actually reasonably homoscedastic. Okay. But when we do the clustering, the standard error has gone up fourfold, right? From 0.0044 to 0.0164. Okay. Four times as large, right? So then that T, all right, originally the T was, uh, here was 10, right? Now it's 448 divided by 16, so I don't know, it's 2.6, something like that. It's really made a big difference. Now, the last two columns, the standard errors are essentially the same 0164, 163, 73, 73, 892, 889. The difference is just because of a slightly different degrees of freedom correction, right? Uh, they're just a, they're a scalar multiple of each other. But what you'll notice is the p-value, right, so this is the p-value of two-sided test of whether it's significant or not. The p-value this way is 0.026 and this way it's 0.006, right. And for a practitioner, it would be very reasonable to either do this or do this, right. Uh, so what's going on? Well, uh, these critical values here are based on, a, sorry, not critical, yes, critical values or p-values, are based on a, a, t, 
a T distribution with the number of clusters minus one degrees of freedom, right? So in this case, it's a T with eight degrees of freedom. When you use the XT reg commands, that goes to asymptotic theory and uses a standard normal, right? And by the time you get down to a T with eight degrees of freedom, the tails are a lot fatter than uh, a standard normal, okay? Uh, and you can imagine this really could make a difference, right? If, if you had a T of two using this, you'd be alleluia. It's just, just under 0.05, right? If you did this way, which is what I, you should do, uh, bad news, right? The P is going to be more than 0.05. Uh, okay. Then another thing you'll notice is if we want to do uh, a test of overall significance, are the, joint, the regressors jointly statistically significant? Well... This is the F test, 95, 89, not reported, right? And you'll see that, right, uh, in some cases, and it's like, hmm, well, I didn't really need the F test, so that's not a problem. But if it can't do the F test, can I believe the rest, right? And the answer is, yes, you can, okay? And I'll come to it. Uh, and what, what's, what, what is happening is that by construction, the cluster robust variance covariance matrix has a rank that is at most, sorry, is the minimum of the number of regressors or the number of clusters minus one. Okay? Now, in this case, there are nine clusters, so the maximum rank is eight. Right. The rank of the variance covariance was eight, but we had 10 regressors, including the intercept, so the overall F test is of nine restrictions. Okay. okay, so uh, this example, or an example like this, with an aggregated regressor, everyone in the group has the same... Uh, uh, same regressor, was highlighted, first of all, in two papers by Moulton in 86 and uh, 1990, right? And these papers came out before people knew about doing cluster robust standard errors, right? So in this case, this was presented in a feasible GLS uh, framework where you'd specify a model for the variance covariance for the variance covariance matrix of the errors. Okay. And uh, so this is much much cited papers that pointed out that in this setting you had to be careful. Okay. Uh, and then I, I've already talked about the rest there. Okay. So that's example number one, right? These that so there are two stereotypical examples of uh, clustering in this uh, public labor literature, right? Uh, but I'd say even more general than that. I mean, well, I'm talking about situations where we're thinking like cross-section people. So we, we have, uh, you know, independence over groups. Uh, and then, uh, but we have correlation within groups. Right. The first way was, you know, thinking of different people in the village, in the region, in the occupation. Uh, and there, the, the one I just did, the correlation is going to be fairly uh, exchangeable, right? That the correlation of the error between Fred and Joe is going to be similar to that between Joe and John, okay? The second examples where there's correlation are in a time series setting, okay? So here we have states and years or regions. We again assume independence across regions, uh, but within region, the correlation between 1990 and 1991 is no longer going to be the same as that between 1990 and 1992. Right? There's going to be damped correlation. Okay? But we get similar results. For some things, the asymptotic theory may differ a little bit, but it's... it's, it's you know, the, we're getting things through independence across groupings uh, and we'll have similar problems. So here, uh, what we're interested in, say, is the effect of minimum wage laws. In the US, minimum wage laws are 
at the state level, not at the national level. Uh, some states do not have a minimum wage law, so this indicator variable DTS will be zero throughout. Others had it right from the beginning of our data to the end, so it's always one. Some didn't have it and brought it in, so it's going to be zero for a while and then one for a while. Okay? So as a result, we're going to have a regressor that is not perfectly correlated over time within state, but is going to have high correlation. Okay? And uh, we're going to have the same uh, problems again. Okay? What's a little bit different about this one is because, so this is a, you know, a difference in differences model, very, very popular. Because this is not perfectly correlated uh, within state, here we can bring in fixed effects. Right? In the previous example, if we put in an occupation fixed effect, then we'd no longer identify the occupation injury uh, risk variable. Right? Here, uh, I mean, we'll lose a lot of precision by bringing in state dummies, but we could bring in state dummies and do fixed effects if we wanted to. Okay, so uh, again, right, this is highly correlated. I think this error is going to be correlated over time. If we overpredict for California in 1990, we're likely to overpredict uh, in California in 1991. Uh, we are following what everyone does and assuming independence across states. Right? You could bring in spatial correlation if you wanted to and say, well, maybe the error for California is correlated to the error for Nevada. Uh, people are starting to think about that now. Uh, I think in practice that's not going to make much difference actually to the standard errors. But uh, at the moment, you know, for simplicity, we're just saying we have independence across states, but within state, there's correlation over time. Okay. Uh, often in this literature, people may actually have individual level data. So we have lots of individuals in each state and year, right? But it'll be the same problem. Okay, we've got a, a regressor that's uh, aggregated. Okay, so this was particularly highlighted in a uh, QJE paper in 2004 by Bertrand de Flo and Melanathan. So this is only 10 years ago, right? And the paper was probably written 12 years ago. And it was pointed out that, you know, even after Moulton's highly cited work of 10 years earlier, and even though we now had the cluster robust option, uh, people were unaware of this problem. So they said, you know, there's something like 100 papers only 10 people were aware of this problem. Uh, and then, uh, actually, those who were aware of it often clustered on the wrong thing, right? And in this application, they would say, well, I should cluster, and they would cluster on state year pair, right? But by doing that, you're assuming that the error for California in 1990 is independent of the error for, for California in 1991. Right. And it's going to be correlated. In this example, you should cluster on state, not on state year pair. Okay. And then another paper that came out uh, at a similar time by uh, Kesdi was a little bit more focused on fixed effects and considered both uh, number of groups going to infinity and number of time periods going to infinity. But he uh, looked at some of these uh, issues as well. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, motivation. All right. Uh, this is what the paper goes through. I won't go through all of this. Um, what I will emphasize is particularly just the start, right, and try and say, why is it that the standard errors change uh, by so much? Uh, and then... Uh, Often, you know, what happens if there are fixed effects and what to cluster over? And then the last bit I'll just whiz through. Okay, so let's go back to the simplest case of inference on a sample mean. Okay, so this is the first thing we would uh, teach in an introductory statistics class. Okay, 
and uh, we'll we would typically assume independence of observations and then we know that the variance of the sample mean is sigma squared over n, right? And we'd estimate that by s squared over n, okay? And we're interested in y bar because that's our estimate of the population mean mu, okay? What if instead uh, our data were correlated, okay? Well, then the variance of the sum is the sum over i and j of the covariances, right? Uh, this result here, the simplification happened because with independence, covariance of y, i, and y, j is zero uh, if i does not equal j. So you just pick up the i equal j terms, there's, we're summing n of them, so we would get n times sigma squared times one over n squared gives me the one over n squared, uh, one over n sigma squared, okay? If we have correlation, then we not only have to sum the variances, but we have to sum the, the covariances for j, j not equal to i. Okay. In the first example that we had, the, uh, the grouping and occupation, there's no natural ordering of the data. So a starting point is to say, if these observations are correlated with each other, it's going to be equicorrelated. That the correlation between, ordering doesn't matter. So the correlation between, if there is correlation between observations one and five, it's going to be similar to that with any other pair, one and six, three and 10, right? So, uh, and that correlation is just the variance multiplied by a correlation coefficient rho, okay? Well, if we just do a little bit of algebra, instead of getting the usual one over n sigma squared, we get one over n sigma squared magnified, right? And it's magnified by the number of observations that we're dealing with times the correlation of each, right? And even if they're really weakly correlated, like that correlation is point, well, I'm gonna do point one, but even if it was say point zero one, if it was point zero one, oops, and we had 101 observations, this would be 100 times 0.01, two, right? The variance would be twice what we think it is, okay? So I go through one with uh, 0.1, okay? Which is the same thing as saying, look, if I could regress one observation on another, the R squared for that regression is rho squared or 0.01, so, Right. By most standards, this is pretty weak correlation. By empirical micro standards, actually maybe this is strong correlation, but still we'll go with this example. Uh, and I picked some nice numbers. I picked n equals 81, and I put it through this formula, and the variance is actually nine times the independence case. Okay. Uh, and as an aside, I'll say that uh, Often when we teach introductory uh, statistics, we actually have correlated data, right? <laughs> so I'll say, well, here's an example. I've got the you know, inflation rate in the US for the last 50 years, uh, annual data. Uh, as an exercise, go away and get a 95% confidence interval, right? And uh, right, in doing that, you know, they'll just put it through as, you know, it, it, we, we'll assume that the errors are uncorrelated. Well, actually, inflation one year is quite highly correlated with inflation the next year. And really what we should be doing in our introductory classes is saying, run a regression with an intercept uh, and then get the correct variance covariance matrix. Okay. Um, okay, so it makes a big difference. That result is going to carry over immediately to the regression case. So in the regression case, this is the individual level data, individual I and group G. First of all, we will stack over individuals in a given group. Okay, so this is a vector whose dimension is the number of individuals in group G. Then we'll stack over groups 
and we've got the usual y equals x beta plus u. Okay. The estimator can be written in three ways, right? x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, we're familiar with that. If I then break it out into groups, it's this, or individual level this. So we can write it one of these three ways. Uh, for the analysis, it's best to write it this way, right? x transpose x inverse, we've got that. What we need is we need the variance of this, or, or the variance of x transpose u, we're going to use independence across groups. So we want the variance of this, but because we have independence over G, that's going to be the sum over G of the variance of this. Okay. So, right, beta hat equals beta plus X transpose X inverse, X transpose U. The variance of beta hat will be X transpose X inverse, the variance of X transpose U, X transpose X inverse. So that's what we've got x transpose x in, I'm being a little bit more formal here by putting in expectations over the x's, x transpose x inverse, and then the variance of the middle bit, given our assumption of independence across groups, uh, is this bit here, okay? And that's not the simplest sigma squared x transpose x inverse, okay? Before the 1980s, uh, what people would say is, okay, we need this. In order to get this, I'm going to have to make some assumptions about the expected value of UG, UG transpose, right? We need to put some structure on here. Uh, so, for example, uh, we might do feasible GLS assuming equicorrelation, which is asymptotically equivalent to a random effects model, right? There's a group random effect. Uh, post 1980s, people realized uh, that actually what we need is we just need an estimate of this. And this is just a K by K matrix where K is the number of uh, regresses, and that's fixed, right? And our asymptotic theory will be in the number of clusters going to infinity, right? So without putting structure on expected value of UG, UG transpose, we can still estimate this middle matrix. Okay, so ahead of that, let's just go with the equicorrelation. What would happen with this model, which I think is a quite reasonable starting point for the um, example one, the, the uh, occupation uh, uh, injury risk example, okay? Well, there's an exact result if we have balanced clusters. So we have the name, same number of observations in each group and uh, all the regressors are invariant within the group. That result holds approximately with this generalization. This is, a, this is a very, I found a very good rule of thumb, okay? The, Default standard errors, this, the S squared X transpose X inverse, should be, okay, this is the variance estimate, sorry, should be multiplied by this. So the standard errors should be multiplied by the square root of this. And it's one plus the correlation of the regressor of interest within the group times the error correlation within group times the average number of observations within each group. So if you remember, the first example I had was one plus, right? Before it was just the sample mean, that's regression on an intercept, and everyone had the same intercept. So I had an example with rho xj equal one, and then I said it was the correlation of y, but that would be the correlation of the uh, error term times the number of observations, okay? So, right, uh, right, you know, I'm saying this result here, right, I've got again the default one plus number of observations in the group times rho is the correlation of y, but here that's the error correlation, and then all I've added in is a, a, a rho xj.
Okay, and this result was in the econometrics literature in 81 and 82. Uh, if we go back to the Moulton example, Moulton illustrated the problem using data from the current population survey. Uh, and when we round his numbers, there were on average 81, I'm choosing nice numbers, 81 observations per state. Uh, the regressor was invariant within state. And in his example, the error correlation within uh, state was point, uh, point 0.1. Okay, uh, and we crank it through and we get the same thing, right? The standard errors are out by a factor of three uh, if you fail to uh, cluster robust on state. Okay. Yes, and one rest, well this is, yeah. you could quite reasonably believe uh, that there was no need to do this, right? That well, I might think, well, yeah, maybe the regressor is highly correlated, but I know the errors aren't going to be very correlated, so it doesn't matter, right? Uh, but it does, okay? And a lot of that is because the error correlation doesn't dampen, right? It's always row, right? In a time series setting, right, if it's an AR1 model, even if rho is quite large, like, you know, say 0.8, go out two periods, it's 0.8 squared, 0.64. Go out three periods, it's already down to about 0.5, right? Here, what's killing us is you go from one person to the next, it's 0.1, okay, that's small. Go another person, it's still 0.1. Go another person, still 0.1, okay? Uh, and, you know, if you cranked through the algebra and said, okay, what if I didn't have 81 observations, but I had, twi uh, I don't know, twice as many. If I had 162 and put it through the same formula, right? if data was independent, you'd find that the variance is going to be one half. Right? We've doubled the number of observations, uh, so our, our, we've got more precise estimation, half. Okay, what you'll find is instead, actually, you just reduced you increase your precision by just a couple of percent, right? It didn't make much difference. Okay. So how do we estimate this uh, middle piece, the variance of X transpose U? Okay. How White uh, had a classic 1980 paper, which has something like 20,000 uh, Google Scholar sites, uh, and pointed out that we want to estimate this. We don't need a model for expected value of UI squared. Uh, just put in the squared residual, okay? And it's not that UI hat squared is a good estimate of expected value of UI squared, right? In fact, it's, ter you know, in the limit, UI hat squared, right, what is the error? It's yi minus xi transpose beta hat. What is uh, beta hat? It's consistent. So, you know, with a large amount of data, this, the squared residual is behaving the same as the squared error, right? So asymptotically, this is behaving as ui squared. And what we wanted was its expected value, right? We wanted the variance of the error. We didn't want the squared error. Uh, so this has nothing to do with expected value of UI squared, right? But what it is, is it's the whole piece, right? What we need is that the average of this estimate has the same probability as the average of this piece up here. And uh, White gave the conditions under which that happens. And you need to assume more. You need to make some assumptions about existence of fourth moments and so on. Uh, assumptions that we seem quite happy to live with, okay? Well, the same thing is going to carry over for the cluster robust. For the cluster robust, what we have is we have uh, the, not only the error variances within cluster, but we have the covariances within cluster, okay? And again, we're just going to replace where wherever there's you know an expected value of UI UJ, we're going to put in a UI hat 
UJ hat. Okay, so um, just put in the errors, okay? Now I've got a tilde on there because there are small sample corrections. If we go back to the heteroscedastic case, well, actually, if we go back to the homoscedastic case, in the homoscedastic case, we wouldn't estimate sigma squared by 1 over n summation i u i hat squared. We have a degrees of freedom correction. We'd use 1 over n minus k. Okay. So then when you do the heteroscedastic robust, uh, actually what's used is this is scaled up by n divided by n minus k. Similarly, uh, here, we scale the residual up by either the number of clusters, number of groups divided by the number of groups minus one, or that times this additional correction. Now in that first example that I gave, where I gave four sets of variance estimates, and I said the last two columns, there was a slight difference in the standard errors because of degrees of freedom correction. Uh, the regress was using this, and the XT reg was using this, right? And in this particular example, the, right, in, you know, we had a lot of observations, one and a half thousand observations, so this ratio was very close to one. So it didn't make much difference. But in other applications, uh, it could make a difference. Okay, so this, uh, well, there's several references to that, um, pointed this out through the 1980s. The two most commonly used are uh, in biostatistics literature is the JASA article by Liang and Ziga in 1986. And then in the econometrics literature, uh, there's a 1987 paper by Ariano who additionally applied it to the fixed effects uh, estimator. Okay. Uh, and then uh, interestingly, Stata incorporated it very early, and the reason for that was there was someone working at Stata on, um, who knew about survey commands, right? And in the, in, when you work with complex surveys, complex surveys will use uh, uh, clustered sampling, right? It's expensive to randomly choose, you know, 10,000 people in the United States. Right. Instead, you randomly choose regions, you know, say census blocks, and then within that maybe pick several households. But then there will be uh, correlation uh, in those census blocks. So survey people actually were aware of this, uh, at least in the univariate case, in the 1960s. Um, and so Rogers uh, brought it in in 1993 into Stata, uh, at least for commands that did not have fixed effects. Okay. So the old school way of allowing for complications in the uh, correlations in the errors was to do feasible GLS. You'd specify a model, right? So uh, one other I've talked about here is equicorrelation. So now we have both a sigma squared and a rho to estimate, but that's only two parameters. We can do that, given those estimates, plug them in to get a rho hat, right? Or if it was a time series example, yt equals rho yt minus one, again, get the rho hat uh, and plug it in, okay? Uh, people are reluctant to do that because the variance, covariance matrix you get out of it, X transpose omega inverse X inverse depends on assuming that we've correctly specified omega or the functional form for omega. Well, actually, you can robustify it, okay? So you can do uh, feasible GLS with a model uh, and then afterwards go VC robust. And particularly in the latest version of Stata, you can do things like XT reg YX comma PA, uh, population averaged, then correlation and put in some, what you think is the appropriate correlation for the errors, say exchangeable uh, or AR1, uh, and then go VC robust and it will 
generalize this formula to the feasible GLS case. Okay, so uh, that's what I've got here. And we tend to just use random effects in, uh, in the first uh, example. But actually, other areas of statistics have hierarchical linear models that particularly allow you to relax the assumption of uh, homoscedasticity, right? So the, the random effects model assumes that alpha G is IID, right? There's none of these variances and covariances that come out of here uh, depend on the regresses, right? But if we use the mixed commands, we can uh, more flexible, and, and they can be robustified. Okay. In the second setting, uh, the state year panel, there the natural error structure is that you know, the error for California this year is a multiple of that last year plus some noise. Right? And that would be XT reg Y, X, P, A, correlation AR1, VC robust. Okay, so I think I have a bit over 10 minutes to go. So here's a puzzle. Why is feasible GLS not used more? Okay, so now, you know, in most literature, people are aware that they have to do the cluster robust, but there are a lot of people that are really disappointed that that T of 5 became a T of 1.6, right? If only I could get it up to 2. Well, it's possible if you used a more efficient estimator, you could get it up to 2, right? And you can robustify, so you can guard against having the, you know, not the ideal model for the uh, error correlation, okay. Um, you know, I think there's a real uh, opportunity here. There's not always an improvement, okay. If it's just straight, you know, think back to the original heteroscedasticity, or well, the simpler heteroscedasticity, my experience is there's little efficiency gain in doing weighted least squares versus doing um, uh, just regular OLS, right? But in these settings when there's correlation across errors, there can be uh, efficiency gains. Okay, this explains the result earlier, the ranked efficiency, right? And the bottom line is that if you see that F test, uh, it can't be done, right? then as long as you're in this situation, you're fine. Uh, and uh, actually, in that previous example, the rank was eight. You can actually test eight restrictions. You just can't test uh, nine restrictions, okay? Uh, not all software has a cluster robust option. Right, uh, Stata has it more than other packages, but even within Stata, it's not always available for all commands, uh, and it also varies with the version. So, for example, for the uh, mixed models, in version 12 of Stata, uh, the command was XT mixed, and I think in version 12 there was still no VC robust option. Right, so if you wanted to robustify. Uh, you'd actually have to do a bootstrap instead, okay? Uh, and what the bootstrap is, is we just resample over, uh, you have to resample over something that's independent, right? Here are the independences across clusters. So you resample the clusters and you make up, say, 400 data sets. And you do the resampling with replacement. So maybe your first data set, if there's 10 clusters, we resample with replacement to get 10 clusters, the first cluster might appear in that data set once. The second cluster may not have been picked at all. The third cluster is picked twice, right? And so on. And be, so, you know, in, in the different resamples, it's gonna be, you know, some clusters don't appear at all, some appear several times. Each time around, we're generally gonna get a different beta hat. So you get 400 beta hats, and you just get the regular variance of those 400 beta hats. And, and, and use, use that, right? Asymptotically, that's equivalent to what we've done before, right? So this is something that you do if 
your package doesn't have the appropriate robust option. Uh, it's also something to do if you want to do a Hausman test, right? Because the usual Hausman test is wrong if you think you need to cluster robust. A Hausman test looks at the difference between two estimates and it says the variance of the difference is the difference in the variances. But the difference in the ver that result only holds if you're using a fully efficient estimator and if you think you need to cluster robust, you're not using a fully efficient estimator. Okay. And that's, so, okay, now fixed effects. Um, With fixed effects, uh, first of all, people think if we put the fixed effect in, that will control for within cluster. Okay. It will sop up some and maybe quite a lot of the error correlation, but it will not, in practice, soak all of it up. Okay. And the way to think of that is, right, we have this model here. The dependent variable uh, depends on the usual axis. And then we've got uh, an individual specific mean, uh, uh, intercept, right? So this alpha G, different clusters, there's a different intercept to the regression, okay? Well, the simplest case of this would be when there's just one cluster. Right? So what we'd have is I'm going to regress yi on regresses and an intercept and an error. And in that simple case, you wouldn't say, oh, by putting an intercept in the model, uh, I don't have to worry about error correlation. Right? You'd still be worried about it, particularly if it was, say, time series data, right? ut equals. Well, similarly, in this group setting, right, it'll sop up a fair bit, but it won't sop up everything in practice. Uh, so if you do, for example, xt reg com yx comma fe fixed effects, you need to additionally uh, still go VCE robust. And Stata was actually fairly late in bringing that in as an option uh, uh, into xt reg. Okay. In terms of the theory, if the number of clusters goes to infinity, bringing in the fixed effects is not a problem. So, if we have few observations per cluster, the fixed effect will be inconsistently estimated, right? That doesn't contaminate the uh, estimation of beta. That's the miracle of fixed effects estimation. But also, it turns out we can, we can again, use the usual uh, cluster-robust estimate of the variance matrix. Um, There's several ways of bringing in fixed effects. You can estimate the model using a fixed effects command, or you can do the least squares dummy variable models where you just bring in lots of dummy variables for fixed effects. It turns out that one of those handles degrees of freedom correctly and one doesn't, and you should use this. Right? And in particular, if there are only two observations per cluster, if you use this command here, the least squares dummy variable, and you go cluster robust, then the true variance of beta hat is twice uh, what this command gives. Okay, so you really can be out if there's few observations per cluster. Okay. If you have few observations per cluster, the cluster-specific fixed effects are inconsistently estimated. Generally, that doesn't cause a problem, uh, but it does if you want to do feasible GLS with an AR1 error, but there's corrections for that. Okay. Um, it's not always obvious what to cluster over, um, but I think in most applications, If the error is not going to be highly correlated, uh, I think usually it's, we just look at, there's one regressor we're really interested in. 
if that regressor is highly correlated in the group, or whatever the group is, that's what we should cluster over. Uh, if you're not sure whether to cluster, say, over village or regions, cluster over region. Choose the bigger uh, uh, area. Clustering over survey design, as I said, uh, a lot of the survey data we use has clustering in it, but usually we cluster at a bigger level anyway. So their clustering would be, say, at the primary, sam primary sampling unit. Uh, in the US examples, you'd cluster on state. Well, state is already bigger than the primary sampling unit. What if there's more than one way to cluster? Okay, well, uh, so in the first example on, we had occupation injury risk. We also had data on injury uh, rates in industry, right? So there's both a regressor aggregated at the industry level and one at the occupation level. What to do? Well, it turns out that if we do a cluster robust on industry, a cluster robust on occupation, a cluster robust on industry occupation pair, add the first two variance matrices, subtract the third, uh, that handles that case. Okay? That generally doesn't make much of a difference, except it does in international trade data using the gravity model. Right? And there, you really can be out. And this will be mitigated a little bit by bringing in fixed effects, but quite a number of uh, studies in international trade are substantially overestimating the precision of their estimators. Okay, so the final point I wanted to make was that in the US there's 50 states. We need number of clusters to go to infinity. Other countries only have 10 states, eight states. What should we do, okay? Well, there you do need to do a uh, finite sample correction, okay? And at a minimum, use T, G minus one degrees critical values, right? So we had, I had that third column and the fourth column. You need to use not standard normal critical values, but uh, a T with the, with the uh, degrees of freedom, the number of clusters minus one, okay? Even that will lead to overestimating the precision, right? You'll have tests that are still a little bit uh, overly optimistic, right? If you report a P of 0.06, it's probably not uh, uh, 0.06, it's probably more, I don't know what, 0.08, it's something a bit bigger. Okay. And this is an active area of research at the moment. Uh, one solution is to improve the variance matrix estimate. Uh, a second one is to do a, uh, a bootstrap, but a more refined bootstrap, one that can improve finite sample performance. So the previous one, bootstrap that I gave, was just similar order asymptotics to doing the usual cluster robust. This is a more refined uh, uh, bootstrap. It doesn't appear in other uh, empirical settings because the analog of this with independent data would be I've got 10 observations, right? Uh, what degrees of freedom should I use? You know, what should I do? Standard normal, should I do T, okay? Well, we have some theory there that says, you know, T of eight. Uh, if there was just two regressors, and I assume normality, what if we don't have that, et cetera? Well, if you only had 10 observations in a cross-section setting, things would be so imprecisely estimated that there's no point in, you know, it's game over. You know, the T is 0.5 in the first place, right? Here, even if we have few clusters, so our asymptotic theory doesn't hold very well, if we have lots of observations per cluster, we still can fairly precisely estimate things. So it's worthwhile doing this refinement. Okay, and then the third thing is to not use a T with G minus one degrees of freedom, but to figure out a better approximation which will be less than G minus one degrees of freedom. 
Okay, and then this extends to nonlinear models, except with nonlinear models, you have to worry more about whether clustering means your estimator is inconsistent in the first place. So, for example, we know that uh, the fixed effects estimator in the linear model doesn't necessarily carry over to nonlinear models. You know, there's probit with fixed effects is inconsistent unless the number of observations in each cluster goes to uh, infinity. Okay. I just say uh, in this paper, we're finishing off this example at the moment, and this is a menu of different ways that we would compute the variance matrix and the, uh, the, the T distribution or the distribution to use for testing, particularly when there's only six observations per cluster. And we'd like these numbers to be 0.05. Okay? And we're hoping out of this to you know, have some recommendation, look, this is the... Uh, the best thing to do. Um, uh, and I'd say the main thing is this bottom. Well, is, this is a problem you have to take, uh, pay attention to, right? Uh, if you're working with these sort of data, uh, it can be difficult to know at what level to cluster. Uh, and if you have two clusters, you have to start That's it. Thank you.